been the lead investigator of the case for the past four or five years, I would say. And Meyer's evidence consists of photographs, films, metal, audio, and the prophecies. Now let's start with the photographs. I want to talk about this 1975 photo, this photo from 1981, and then this is a frame grab from a film that Meyer took in 1975 as well. Now as you can see there's something very similar about the tree that appears in these three different uh, shots. They each contain the same bite mark out of the top right of the tree. They have the same angle on the right side of the tree. The film footage is too poor in quality to see any more details, but in the other two photos, the 1975 photo and the 1981 photo, they share the same lower right branch, the same bumps on the trunk of the tree, and the same dangling lower left branch. So maybe the extraterrestrials just like this tree. What, you know, what's the harm in that? This is the location of the 1975 photo. As you can see, there is no tree. No one seems to remember where the film was taken, but it was not taken in either Wetsicon or in Pinwell. And there's over four kilometers between Pinwell and Wetsicon. This panoramic photo composite was actually provided by Figu. What the skeptic failed to show or acknowledge is that Figu also provided this panoramic view overlaid with one of Meyer's many photos of the UFO circling the full-size tree. As you can see, the photo fits in perfectly, validating that both the tree and the UFO were indeed on that very piece of land. It's said that the tree was eliminated later by Semyaze. Strangely enough, the farmer who owns the land continues to this day to mow the grass around the very spot where the tree once existed. So all of the evidence suggests that this same model tree was used in the different photographs and films because the trees all share the same physical characteristics. The tree is the same size and shape even after six years. The photos and films were each taken in different cities. There's no evidence that a real live tree ever existed in any of these locations. And the official explanation from Meyer and his followers is that the extraterrestrials erased people's memories about the tree, but they left the photographs and the films alone. Actually, Meyer took photos of UFOs next to different kinds of trees, including these barren branch trees, four of them in this photograph. He took photos of the UFOs above trees and even in forests. Professional photographer, model maker, and miniature tree cultivator, Jeff Ritzman, tried to duplicate Meyer's UFO tree photos and couldn't. And on top of that, six professors of forestry looked at Meyer's photos and looked at the trees and each one determined that the trees are full-sized mature trees and not models. I don't keep photos of models in my collection. Yes. And I don't keep fakes in my collection. So we faked those and we faked it with models and neither one was of interest to me after Jim pointed out the difference. The model photos have sharper images because light travels less distance, less dispersal. The bottoms of the models are usually darker than the bottoms of the spacecraft because they're smaller and they don't pick up as much light reflection. Billy Meyer has released a handful of 8 millimeter films of his spacecrafts in the 1970s. It's important to understand that Meyer's films have never been transferred to videotape properly. One of the films, Meyer's says, shows that the object cannot be a model because it goes behind a hill in the distance. So does this film prove that the object is large and in the distance because it goes behind the hill? No, it doesn't. The film is just simply too poor in quality to be able to determine this. There is a jump where the, the object appears to be in two places at the same time. Meyer and his followers have stated that this is due to the ability of the object to travel so fast that it literally could appear in two places on one frame of film. The double image was most likely caused by stopping the camera, then changing the object's position, and then turning the camera back on. Meyer and his followers have spent a considerable amount of time discussing the propulsion capabilities of this craft and theorizing on all the properties that it has because the object appeared in two places 
on the same video frame. But all of this time and energy was wasted because I simply did not understand how film is transferred to videotape. Four frames of film need to become five frames of video. This is done by duplicating some film frames onto two different video fields of the same video frame. This causes some video frames to actually contain two different film frames. This is called interlacing. Using the very same film the skeptic refers to, we can see that the UFO does indeed partially go behind the hill. Since the hill is some distance from the camera, perhaps a quarter mile, it's impossible that the UFO is a small model. And notice that there's a continuous movement to the UFO as it flies back to the starting point in the center of the screen, becoming larger as it does. The film experts from Japan's Nippon TV not only looked at and videotaped the film, they looked at the film itself and indeed found the jump is made in only one frame. No cuts, no stops, and no models. In the original highly detailed and thorough investigation report, it was absolutely determined by professional film experts from Nippon TV that the UFO appears in two places at once in only one frame of film. This is a photo of the actual segment of film that they examined. So the transfer rate of film to video is irrelevant to the discussion. I personally showed Meyer's UFO photos and films to the owners of the company that won the Academy Award for Special Effects. When I asked them if these were models, these photos and films, they said, no, we know models and those aren't models. I asked, can you duplicate Meyer's films? And they said, if we could, we'd have to go to CGI. And I reminded them that in 1976 and 78, there was no Photoshop, no CGI, no home computers. Billy Meyer also has metal samples that he claimed demonstrate signs of extraterrestrial manufacturing. This is that metal. The metal sample contained nearly every element in the periodic table, Vogel stated. Each pure element was bonded to each of the others, yet somehow retained its own identity. At 500x magnification, thulium was revealed. At 1600x, there are structures within structures, and at 2500x magnification, the sample was metal, but at the same time, it is crystal. Now this is an image of a diatom. It's a type of phytoplankton at 5000x magnification. Even using magnification far greater than what Marcel Vogel used when he did his examination, it is still impossible to view the elemental or atomic structure of an object using a scanning electron microscope. The resolution of the scanning electron microscope is simply not high enough to image down to that level. In fact, increasing the magnification of any object using any form of microscope will not tell you what the object is made of. The only way to determine the composition of an object is to use a process such as gas chromatography, mass spectrometry. Meyer and his followers point to Marcel Vogel's analysis as another form of proof that Meyer has been in contact with extraterrestrials. When he analyzed the metal samples, he detected the presence of thulium and other rare elements and gases in the metal samples by using spectral analysis, the standards for doing such. With any technology that I know of could not achieve this on this Earth plane. I could not explain the type of material that I have and its discreteness by any known combination of materials. I could not put it together myself. The elements that we found were totally surprising. The major element which is shown here was the rare earth metal thulium, T-H-U-L-I-U-M. Hmm. It was totally unexpected. So now we've seen silicon, iron, thulium, silver, and copper, all in a specimen about this big. When he examined the metal under electron scanning microscope, he then found the micro-machining, which was a clear evidence to him that this was a deliberately manufactured product. We found evidence of what looks like mechanical manipulation. Hmm. One sees now discrete 
marks in a diagonal form in this direction and marks in this direction. But what is exciting, it looks like it's been plowed. In other words, a pressure and there is a scar uh, scarfing on either side. Do we know what this metal is used for? We're told that these metals were representative of a number of the different stages, seven stages of manufacturing that the Playaren go through to create the metal for their spacecraft. Billy Meyer also has an audio recording of what he claims is the sound of one of the extraterrestrial spaceships. It is these eight inaudible frequencies that Meyer and his followers use to point out the extraterrestrial nature of these audio recordings. The complete range of human hearing is from 15 hertz to 20,000 hertz. So no audio cassette tape recorder nor any audio cassette tape can record any frequencies outside the range of human hearing. It doesn't have any merit because the, the analysis done of this audio was in error. happening is the 10 different con frequencies are converging on one central frequency, which is, I find, very interesting. This is probably one of the most interesting things about the tape is that there are... What's this right now? Very, very many tones. Yeah. And they're all changing very fast. It's not uh, synthesizers on the market that have oscillators that change that randomly. Even if you got nine or 10 of them going, they wouldn't change from those peaks that quickly. So a significant thing is this rate of change. And besides, if you were going to create a noise for a spaceship, it, mm -hmm. you'd be hard put to come up with something as original as this. In the original preliminary investigation report done on this case, eight different sound engineers had the opportunities to analyze the sounds on oscilloscopes and spectrum analyzers. These included three different laboratories, including U.S. Naval Undersea Labs. They could find no sound source of record that could produce these sounds. 24 were indeed in the audible range. The eight inaudible sounds were determined through the calculations in a formula based on the existing sounds. To date, even with synthesizers, nobody has been able to duplicate the sounds which we make freely available to anybody who wants to try. So this next prophecy is one that Meyer and his followers claim is the best case example demonstrating the accuracy of his predictions and therefore the ultimate proof that he is in contact with extraterrestrials. And the prophecy reads, the danger of accidents in nuclear reactors will increase throughout the world. Regarding this subject, France in particular must be extraordinarily careful in every way for one prophecy warns of a strong probability for an accident near Lyon. Now the first thing to be aware of is how vague the actual prophecy is. It doesn't say that there will be an accident at a nuclear reactor near Lyon, only that there might be one at some point in the future. However, in 2005, Michael Horn stated that this prediction actually came true. In August of 2003, the world was having the worst heat wave in recorded history. France received 75% of its electrical power from nuclear power stations such as the Bouguer power station located on the Rhone River near Lyon. Nuclear power plants use the river water to cool the reactors and then release the heated water back into the river. French environmental regulations state that the maximum temperature that the water released back into the river can be is 24 degrees centigrade. The reason being that if warmer water were to be released back into the river, it could damage the plant and animal life of the river. This prophecy is one that Meyer and his followers have publicly stated to be the best case example of his accurate ability to see the future. Not only was the plant not shut down in August of 2003, there never was any discussion of shutting the plant down. All of the discussions were on how to keep the plant generating as much electricity as possible. When I first saw the article, I was immediately reminded of Meyer's prophecy regarding this specific nuclear power plant, which was one of 432 on the planet at the time. This prompted me to do more research. We found that article on the internet. It actually preceded the article from 2003 that showed the recent shutdown of that plant. 
The article from 2000 was even more telling. They foresaw tremendous damage had the repairs not been made at that time. Perhaps the most startling of what I call the prophetically accurate information in the Meyer case pertains to Meyer's astronomical information about numerous planets, but especially Jupiter, its rings, its moons. Meyer specifically said that Io was the most volcanically active body in the solar system. He published that five months before we discovered it. More than a year after he published the information on a ring of Jupiter being composed of ionized sulfur particles, Science Magazine published that information in January of 1980. Most impressively, when I sent Meyer's information about Io being the most volcanically active body in the solar system, as published by Meyer five months before the probe got there, Professor Joseph Viverka, the head of the astronomy department at Cornell University, said the following to me, and I quote, If he, Meyer, said that three to six months before, then all I can say is that he was right. A lot of times people ask skeptics or and other scientific organizations to prove that something is a hoax. It's actually not possible to do because the only person who can call something a hoax legitimately is the person who perpetrated it. You would say in your best judgment that what he's used are models. That's yes. There's nothing wrong with the idea of there being life outside of our solar system and life within the galaxy. Um, it's just that so far, Meyer has not presented any evidence to show that any extraterrestrial life has come here that stands up under legitimate scientific scrutiny. There are numerous scientists and experts who have examined, analyzed, and authenticated Meyer's physical evidence, including such stellar personalities as Michael Malin from NASA and the Mars mission. We have sound engineers, photographic and film experts, special effects experts, physicists, and numerous professional facilities at which the physical evidence was examined and authenticated. Again, people are going to have to take a look at that for themselves and decide whether or not it's convincing to them.